Every few years, a new genre of game appears, usually a refinement of some indie game. There's a natural curve to these things, as the popular game becomes more popular, and competitors begin to produce products that iterate and improve on the original. One of the most popular genres in recent history is also one that tends to be controversial. Idle games, incremental games, clickers. These titles are often dismissed immediately because they are too casual, too automated, not game enough. And yet, statistically speaking, you've not only played one of these games, but you've actually got one installed on your phone or PC right now. The personalities involved in idle gaming range from first-time solo coders who managed to produce the number two most played free-to-play game on Steam, to industry veterans with hundreds of millions of dollars in funding, and has created mechanics that have slowly become mainstream, though you may not even realize it. But before we can look at the effects of the idle game, we need to understand its history. Pretty universally, Progress Quest is recognized as the first idle game. Released in 2002, the sum total amount of player interaction can be described as roll a character and then never do anything again. After you select your race, such as Panda Man, Talking Pony, or Demi Canadian, then select your class, such as Robot Monk, Bird Rider, or Tickle Mimic. Click to roll some stats, optionally name your character, and you're off to the races, or the wait line, since you'll never do anything else in this game ever again. From here, your character will quest, loot, upgrade, buy and sell items, and play entirely without your input forever. Originally designed to comment on EverQuest and its contemporaries and the addition of the auto attack. If you've played any MMO or even MMO feature inspired games like Bioware's creations, you've probably used the auto attack. Just click on the enemy and sit back and watch as your character does all the hard work. If you've enjoyed that, Progress Quest is probably for you. As a fun dig at Ton Howard, something everybody enjoys, the Bethesda chief stated that Progress Quest was an influence on Fallout Shelter. But obviously, Progress Quest isn't really a game. You just leave the software up and that's it. Unfortunately, there wouldn't be much progress past this point for almost a decade, but in 2009, Tuckin would release Anti-Idol onto Congregate, the original pre-GameStop Congregate, and the world still didn't really care, but Anti-Idol is the first to really wrap everything up in a package that we, today, would recognize as an idle game. Ironically created as an idle game where you could choose to do things, Tuckin's Anti-Idol would set the stage for idle games for the next decade, and it was updated actively for over six years before the developer fell into a depression and seemingly disappeared. During this period of Anti-Idol's frequent updates, other games would step into the limelight to help build the path to where we are today. One such game was Dr. Ian Bogost's Cow Clicker. Another subversive title intended to show how pointless and stupid Facebook games were, especially aiming to expose games like Farmville and other social games. While it's nearly impossible to show you this game anymore, in 2011, all the cows were raptured, leaving users only able to click the spot where cows used to be. It was created as an experiment, a way to show others how pointlessly bad these games were. And not in the way that they aren't games. Bogost himself is quick to say he never argued they weren't games. But more in the nigh insidious manner which they changed the way players interact with the games. Specifically, he highlights four things. End framing, which, well, boy, Bogost just goes right for it. This is not an easy concept to explain. Essentially, in 1954, Martin Heidegger published his essay, The Question Concerning Technology, wherein he suggests that technology is no longer individual pieces of machinery, but instead how we view the resources and people from that technology. Essentially, when you see empty land, you don't see the rolling pastures, you see the cornfields that should be there, the tractors that should be tilling it, the workers that should be managing it. Everything becomes just another resource, another 
tool. Bogo suggests that games on Facebook inframe your social lives, making your friends just another resource for improving your farm, and in turn, churn your friends into resources for the game itself, further spreading the game and increasing its virality. Second, he accuses Farmville of being compulsive. Similar to Twitter, you check and check and check again to see if someone new has mentioned you. Some of you watching this video just checked your Twitter simply because I mentioned it, so how's that for compulsion? Thirdly is optionalism. Now, this is one segment that is super important to idle games, as the very definition here is that the gameplay is optional. You can choose to get more involved and increase efficiency. And the actions aren't complicated or even necessarily specific to the game itself. Click the timer, wait for the timer, click the timer. Alternatively, pay to not click the timer or to not wait for the timer. And finally, fourth, there's the act of destroying time. This is a concept that many gamers may not even really appreciate in the first place. But the idea is that when we play a game and that game is disrespectful of our time, we do empty things and therefore have empty hours or minutes of gameplay. This is not meaningful time we've spent, but simply wasted time moving from thing to thing. This wasted time is destroyed, gone forever. Bogo suggests that social games like Farmville are actually more destructive because they destroy time even when we're not playing, thanks to FOMO, fear of missing out. Fear that we could be playing and improving our farms, but we're out at the store and not improving our farms. So in response to all of these charges that he levies against Farmville, in 2010, Dr. Ian Bogos reveals Cow Clicker, an experiment to prove how these are all terrible things. A game where you click a cow once every six hours and then a timer starts. You can pay money to click faster, and you can have your friends click your cow to allow you to click the cow faster. You can get different kinds of cow. <laughs> it's all so stupid and clearly making fun of Farmville. And Cow Clicker goes on to be one of the most successful Facebook games and is still played today. Though, you'll remember that I said all the cows were raptured, as in literally removed from the game in 2011. So if you go to play Cow Clicker today, you'll be able to click the spot a cow used to be. People still play this. A few years later in 2013, another small indie game would show up on the internet called Candy Box. A simple text website asking you to eat all the candies or throw 10 of them on the ground and that's all. Or so it seems. Over time, the game increases in complexity, becoming more and more complex, eventually turning into a mini RPG. This is the first time we see what some call the unfoldable idle game, in that the game slowly unfolds itself to become more and more, and eventually, the game you're playing is nothing like the game you started. 2013 was a major year, in fact, and just two months after Candy Box, publisher Doublespeak would release their idle game, A Dark Room. Another unfoldable idle clicker, eventually you go from keeping a single room lit with a fire, to building an entire village, to managing the resources of an entire city, sending out combat trips, and exploring abandoned cities, hunting for resources. This game has an ending, a true ending, not just the point where you stop playing, but a finale. And it went semi-viral, leading to paid iOS and Android ports, selling tens of thousands of copies, and even making it onto the leaderboards. Finally, two months after A Dark Room, in August, we see the release of arguably the most influential idle game, Cookie Clicker. Created by a single developer in a single night, Cookie Clicker was posted to 4chan and had over 50,000 players in the first several hours. A month later, over 200,000 players were online every day, and eventually over 1.5 million players in a single day. To this day, Cookie Clicker is still regularly updated, and nets the developer almost $2,000 a month from Patreon, not including other projects or merch sales. Cookie Clicker was a breakthrough hit for the genre, and usually this is the first idle game people remember playing. 
It got coverage in everything from PC Gamer to The New Yorker, Forbes, and Time. It took almost everything previously and mixed it into a glorious cookie of perfect idleness and then sprinkled in some of its own improvements for flavor. The progression of almost any idle game will almost perfectly mimic Cookie Clicker as you start by clicking rapidly to buy a few upgrades until eventually those upgrades outpace your own clicks. You'll upgrade your purchases to see higher clicks per second and slowly move from low cost, low efficiency upgrades to very high efficiency super upgrades at exorbitant costs. You can prestige. Yes, just like in Call of Duty, you can reset your rank and start over again, giving bonuses to help prove just how extra bad you really are. After the incredible success of Cookie Clicker, idle games were a thing officially. Adventure capitalists would show up and see millions of installs on mobile and tens of thousands of concurrent players on Steam, and in turn, it would provide its own major improvement to the idle game. The ability to progress even while offline, also giving a reason to come back and play again. We saw further refinement and monetization with games like Bitcoin Billionaire, which added in opt-in ads for player reward. The ever-present watch this ad to get some money you see everywhere. Clicker Heroes would be the first example of a studio resampling their own game and reusing the assets to create an idle game without the hard work of creating all new assets, something we'd see other major developers start doing as they would release their own branded idle games. But what is it about these idle games that drive such incredible interest from players? Congregate said that adventure capitalists would see players spend as much as $1,000 in the search for higher numbers. Homa Games said the average user of their idle world pays over $18 over the lifetime. The mechanics from the genre have popped up in surprising places as well. Jennifer Hepler, the senior writer on the Dragon Age series, got her start on a failed game from Toma Technologies called Sora, which was never released, but is described as an experiment into idle games. She would take with her the belief that games should have a fast forward button for combat, just like they have skip buttons for story. And from that, we would see future Bioware titles include story difficulty where combat is made as easy as possible for those who just want to play the story. This would transcend out of Bioware and eventually become a semi-standard addition to many games, most recently Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Additionally, many Chinese MMOs and RPGs now have autoplay features entirely, allowing the player to watch as their character uses skills and defeats bosses entirely without player interaction. And again, the people involved in these games are huge names in the industry. Adventure Capitalist was created by Lance Preeb, who is most notable for being the creator of another very popular game that was picked up for $350 million by Disney called Club Penguin. He then turned around and after leaving Disney a few years later, turned his millions into millions more with Adventure Capitalist. But why? Why would an entrepreneur worth tens or hundreds of millions want to make an idle game? Why would Congregate list their idle games front and foremost when they're pitching to investors? Why would the App Store Games by Revenue leaderboard be filled top to bottom with free-to-play idle games? For the gamer, these are very low pressure, since you can literally walk away from the game at any time and still see progress. There's no feeling of time requirement. You're just filling time you would have otherwise wasted, so what's the harm? Further, you only need to check in occasionally, and every single time you choose to check in, you're being rewarded by the offline progression. The longer you stay away, the more reason there is to come back, and the more progress you're able to make. This strongly rewards players who have lapsed on their addiction and brings them back into the fold. 
The player forgets about the game, walks away, just doesn't see it for a while, whatever it is. Then a few days, a week, a month later, they see the icon and click in. And now they've got a huge amount of extra resources that they can use to see even more progress, recreating those addictive pathways that led to original game use in the first place. This constant positive feedback hits you right in the dopamine. I'd like to take a second here and introduce you to the Skinner Box. Back in the 1920s, a psychologist and behaviorist by the name of B.F. Skinner theorized that by placing a lever in a box, putting a rat in the box, and feeding the rat only when he would press the lever, you could train the rat to press the lever. This was further expanded by Skinner into a process called shaping. And as I describe shaping, you'll start connecting this to all sorts of fun mechanics in gaming, specifically mobile gaming. Shaping is the idea that you should start by rewarding anything that is part of the target behavior. In the case of a rat pressing a lever, you would give the rat food for standing on its hind legs, more food for walking towards the lever, and more food still for touching the lever, even without pressing it. Then, after the rat had started pressing the lever for food, all those shaped behaviors would no longer be rewarded, only the targeted behavior. This is used for dogs, teaching them how to learn complex behaviors, and with humans, too. First, you get a reward for making small actions that are part of the target behavior. Then, you get rewards for getting close to or understanding what the target behavior is. Then, you get rewarded for taking that target behavior. This is why so many mobile games teach you how to use their premium currency and give you small amounts of premium currency for free by the by. All of this serves to reinforce the core gameplay loop of log in, spend your resources, see some noticeable and identifiable progress, then leave, only to return in a few hours. If you spend a while away from the game, that's fine too. The game has created a celebratory moment for you when you return by giving you lots and lots of offline rewards. You are being shaped, but of course, that's obvious. What may not be so obvious is that to the developers, they're very pleased by how these idle games work, because it eliminates some of the less savory aspects of predatory games. There's no energy system, no 10 movements you can complete before you have to leave and come back later, because the system itself just keeps getting more expensive leading to a natural energy system. This, of course, is something us gamers are more likely to find acceptable, because we all know that energy systems are unacceptable. Plus, we totally have control over the situation. Like, I could wait, I could click the button and make things go a little faster, or I could choose to come back later, because my time is valuable. Most of these games add in lots of achievements as well, because that helps provide another sense of progression, another accomplishment. And if you hit a wall, prestige yourself, start over entirely with some bonus to your power. And since you're totally more powerful, you can blast through all those early levels in only an hour or two. You're never just sitting there waiting to progress. You're always making choices, taking control, and it's up to you what your tactical approach will be. Of course, you can always choose to throw a few dollars in. Maybe get a little more money at your current level so you can climb over that hump. Or maybe a multiplayer that will stick with you through prestige. Or even an instant prestige. Just get all the bonuses without working your way up through the ranks again. All you've got to do is just watch a few ads. Totally optional, of course. You're the one in control. You can choose to just wait. But maybe you're not going to waste your time with ads either. Well, luckily, there's a special going on where you can just pay $2 for $10 worth of gems or play this other game. It's also an idle game, and you can play them both if you want, and we'll give you some gems for each. Of course, if you choose not to, if you choose to just go at your own pace, well, there's no failure state. You can progress without doing anything. Very limited interactions are required, and you're always doing something. You may be playing an idle game, but you're not being idle. 
your multitasking and achieving, seeing progress and going further and faster, faster and faster. And developers love it because they're easy to make. The average time one developer spends to make a new idle game is just 12 days. And they have dozens of these games all making money and being played. The retention rate is fantastic. People play for hours and return over and over and over again. And they're addictive, which is always a fantastic option for a type of game to produce when you're a developer. Plus, the monetization options are endless. In-app purchases, reward videos, user acquisition trades, and all of it is presented as optional content, so the user convinces themselves to pay. It's really the perfect type of game when you think about it. If you get a chance, go ahead and play Loot Box Quest by Going Loud Studios. This game is, as is so common with these types of games, designed to be a biting commentary on the current state of the game's industry. Wrapped inside of the type of game and using the type of elements that the industry likes to leverage against you as a player. Remember, these developers are in framing you. You aren't a player, you're a resource. They give you the gems and you press the lever. Loot Box Quest comes from the same developer who made DLC Quest, another piece of commentary, and they're two incredibly smart and well done critiques of the industry. Just before the two hour mark, the game even lets you know that you're nearing the time limit to refund the game if you don't like it. This is the kind of developer we should be supporting, and considering the game is only 99 cents, it's basically like buying one of those gem power-ups. Thanks so much for coming and learning about idle games with me. If you enjoyed this video, please consider sharing it. As a small content creator, you sharing this video helps us make more content and get seen by more people. If it helps, if you share this video and come tell me about it, I'll give you a cookie. Of course, feel free not to. If you want to watch other videos, you can do that in the corner right now. And as always, we'll see you on the next one.